I'm Nikki Almacy, a photojournalist working in Asia for over 15 years. During this time I've had the opportunity to shoot the most exciting projects from architecture through culture to art and heritage. Through Photojournalist Diaries I would like to invite you along this journey, so if you feel like it please hit the subscribe button. I was traveling through Isfahan, one of Iran's major cultural cities, when I ran into these youngsters, these students who were helping me out with directions. And I remember one of them said, look dude, you're definitely being followed. You're a foreigner, you're traveling across Iran alone. Somebody is following you, believe me. But it didn't feel like that at all. And if someone was following me, he or she had a very, very busy nine days crisscrossing the country because I was constantly on the move trying to track these stories down that I had in mind. By the year 2018, my travels with AirAsia speeded up to an extent that I was doing like uh, 140,000 kilometers a year, which is about three and a half times around the Earth. So naturally, when I sat down with someone to talk, they always asked me which is my favorite country to visit. And without any hesitation, I always answered Iran. I think I mentioned in an earlier episode how these stories and assignments came about. Basically, I was given uh, certain countries, cities, regions, provinces, where I had to find like a cultural angle to write about and shoot and go on location. So this time it was Iran. And what I found was the hammams, the traditional Iranian bathhouses and uh, the Persian carpets. Both of them were actually very rich subjects. I had a little bit of help because my friend recommended me this tour agent based in Tehran and it was this really really nice guy who came to pick me up from the airport and even though I had hotel booked in Tehran he drove me to his place, introduced me to his family and I slept there and, and uh, his mom was cooking for me and it was just unbelievable. It was an unbelievable welcome. I must say this, that even though I knew that uh, people from Iran were extremely nice and kind and cultured and welcoming, uh, from a photography point of view, I had this um, fear of shooting in Iran because I heard these horror stories about foreign photographers kept in jail and treated very badly. So I, I was kind of tense when I, I landed in Iran and I knew I had to shoot for over a week. But soon, luckily, these preconceptions uh, faded away. Basically, if there's one advice that I could give to a photographer who's planning to shoot in Iran, would be that uh, if you see any authority, like a soldier or a policeman or something like that, try not to flash your camera in front of them and try not to take pictures because that would definitely start your troubles and you would be questioned for sure. Uh, I, I had only one occasion like this in Tehran when I was uh, trying to capture this interesting mural and I was finding an angle and I was backing 
backing away from this wall and what I didn't notice that there was a military base behind me and suddenly this uh, soldier through the fence stepped on my shoulder armed and uh, he just asked me what I was doing and I, I really explained to him I was just uh, taking some photos of the wall because I liked it. Basically I just played the stupid tourist and uh, eventually got away with it but maybe I was just lucky I don't know maybe if that soldier would have been so nice um, uh, it could have been a different situation because I, I really believe that you can end up in really serious trouble when shooting in Iran. So I spent, I think, half a day in the Grand Bazaar just talking to people, inquiring, and meanwhile I could shoot my other subject to the, the bathhouses. And I was very lucky because the tour guide and his family recommended their family driver, Husseini, who I hired by day, and uh, it, it meant an incredible help that I was in his cab and completely safe uh, just driving around Tehran and uh, he knew all these addresses that I had on my list, so he drove me there and came with me and kind of communicated with the, with the vendors too. So, so uh, Hussein, he changed everything for me instead of running around on my own in, in, uh, in Tehran. A lot of people made a long-lasting and great impression on me in Iran and Tehran, but Hussein was definitely one of them who remained with me the longest because he was this old man with uh, sad eyes and I could actually read some sad history from his eyes especially because we, we, we couldn't speak, he, his English wasn't good enough to communicate so it was like a classic setup that we drove around all day in a cab without uh, talking, we were just listening to this really nice uh, uh, Iranian radio station with, with, with Persian music and it was just, uh, it, it set the mood for the days. <laughs> Whenever I think back of Iran, Hussein is always there in my thoughts. Uh, he was really, really nice and, and very helpful. And I remember he always asked me, like, Daftar, Daftar, give me Daftar. Daftar meant uh, my notebook that included all the addresses to these places where we were going. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a very good memory of, of, of Husseini for sure. After I finished with what I had to do in Tehran, I headed to, uh, to my second destination, Isfahan, which is a city uh, about 400 kilometers outside Tehran. In Isfahan I spent a day or two because this is where I found my first important contact, um, Parsa Golemi, who was a carpet trader in the local market, in the Isfahan market and he had all the information I needed. Actually, I think Pastor Golemi was the key to the whole story and he was, the, he, was the, he was a gold mine of information and definitely the key person. Not only because he gave me all the information and the background and the history I needed to, for the Persian carpets, but also he helped me further with further contacts in the next cities that I had to go to, to Yazd and Kashan. So he was an incredible help and I think he was the person who actually cracked the story for me and this is where it, the story started to come together thanks to him. When I was not doing interviews or shooting I had some time to explore the city. I met some youngsters that I mentioned earlier who took me around and I also shot some bathhouses uh, in Isfahan.
Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, good, good. Where are you from? Uh, Majoristan. Majoristan speak Russian? Hungary, Hungarian. Hungary. Major. 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 Okay. <laughs> Have a good time. You too, you too. Goodbye. I went down to this famous bridge called, I think it was called Siosapol Bridge, and uh, I just sat down there. There used to be a river there that ran through it, but unfortunately it dried out. So I just walked around the area and explored Isfahan, and I shot a, uh, another couple of places. So I, I got to enjoy Isfahan a little bit before I moved on to my next destination, Yaz. <laughs> took the bus further down south, I think it was 400 kilometers from Isfahan and the city's name is Yazd, it's like a desert city which again, uh, just it was just incredible and because of Parsa Golemi's help I found my next carpet trader there, a guy named Adel in the local market and he further helped me with information, a, a different kind of information about the Persian carpet. This is actually where the story got interesting because I found out a lot of new information. I found out there were actually uh, carpets were categorized into two, like the urban, the city carpets and the nomadic carpets. And, uh, and uh, of course the nomadic carpets were more expensive because they were made, uh, they were handmade in uh, in the rural areas. For example, I remember Adel told me one community, the Bakhtiari people in the Zagros mountains were making them and these were extremely uh, expensive. But there were a lot of things about the carpets. They were actually, they were varied where were they from and the uh, Isfahan carpets have different prices. Some of them went up from 2,500 USD to $5,000. Um, so there was a lot of good info and then one of the things that I found out there were the so-called war carpets which were uh, imported from Afghanistan and, and all the patterns in these carpets were very uh, uh, intricate and, and uh, there were kind of codes to, to, to people's lives who were making them and uh, the war carpets which were uh, imported from Afghanistan, they were full of these machine guns and stuff like this in the carpet. And it's interesting because when I was growing up in Hungary, uh, in our house, we had a lot of these uh, Persian carpets and it looked like that I was uh, playing with my toy cars, these matchboxes on, uh, on, on, on riddles, really. <laughs> Found a few more bath houses, the hammams in also in Yazd and Isfahan. But along the way I had to make an adjustment to the story because most of the bathhouses were converted to tea houses. And also because uh, with Travel360, with AirAsia's in-flight magazine, we, we always look for human elements for these pictures, for these stories. There weren't that many people in these places. And the tea houses had a lot of people, so we, we, we had to make a change in the end and uh, run the tea houses story instead of the bathhouses. Everywhere I went, I loved the architecture of the bathhouses. I mean, especially the ceilings were were absolutely breathtaking. In Isfahan I found the Hamame Ali Goli Aga and uh, in Yazd I found the Hamame Khan which was also converted into a tea house. <laughs> I 
must say I was very worried about shooting in Iran in the first few days, but but later on I eased up uh, so much and it, it, it became just very easy. And also getting around as I was traveling by buses, long distance buses between these cities, I found myself in situations when I was completely alone as a foreigner, like 4 a.m. in the morning in a, in a long distance bus station in the middle of the desert. So, um, and I never felt any danger. First, I was really planning my way around not to get into trouble. But in the end, when I, I finally went to Kashan uh, n uh, near, near Tehran, I didn't even plan my, my trip really. What I did was I was kind of relying on people's kindness. So I left the hotel and I, I, I asked around. So every, everywhere I went, I just asked people because everybody was so helpful. Because usually in every country, people do help. Uh, although, although I could tell you one or two that they definitely don't. But Iran was, was really exceptional and, and people really bent over backwards to, to help. I mean, I, I, I remember I was traveling on a bus once in Isfahan and I just asked some questions for directions and people actually got off with me from the bus and walked with me to, the, to, 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 to where I was going. And it happened once. It happened to me a lot of times in Iran. So it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very special. It's really, really special. Unfortunately, I never went to Shiraz. Uh, I have to leave that out because I couldn't go that far south. I had to go back. And uh, so I returned to uh, Tehran soon and kind of continued there, whatever I could in the last two days. Iran remains in me as the most special place I've ever been to and something so different from anything that I've ever seen. When I got on my flight back to Kuala Lumpur, uh, it was almost empty, really just a few rows. There were some people behind me, but, but, but the plane was completely empty. And when I got back to Kuala Lumpur, I got the news that AirAsia actually finish the routes to, to Tehran and won't be flying anymore to Iran uh, and they cancelled the, the flights after about two or three months so uh, we had to rush those two articles out very quickly. <laughs> <laughs>